Stanford University. Okay, well, welcome to lecture number 13 of Stanford CS 193P, fall of 2013-14. And today I'm going to go over the requirements for your final project. And then I'm going to talk a little more, a few more slides about core data um, and how it hooks up with UI table view because those two are a match made in heaven. And then I'm going to do this gigantic core data with table views uh, demo. All right, so your final project, uh, there's kind of two phases to your final project. One is you have to submit a proposal to us, which we'll review. We're mostly just reviewing it for scope to make sure you haven't picked too big a project or too small a project. Okay, we're not, you know, looking at in detail of every single thing you're going to do. We're just trying to make sure that you're headed in the right direction because over the course of the final project, you can, of course, talk to us and ask us questions and uh, interact with us to kind of get an idea of getting, you know, hitting a good target at the end. Um, so that is really due immediately. We'd like you to get us your proposal. If you know what you're going to do, please submit a proposal as soon as possible. Uh, if you don't, get on it right away and submit it as soon as possible. Really though, by next Wednesday would be the latest we'd want to hear from you. If we, if we, and, and I hate to say that because I know a lot of you wait until the day before a deadline to do anything and I understand that uh, impulse, but this is something where you want to get that proposal in sooner in case we have issues and we can get back to you and you can iterate, maybe come up with a whole new proposal if what you're thinking about is not going to work. Um, then the second phase is the final project itself, and that project, the code for that project, along with a keynote set of keynote slides for a two-minute presentation about your project, are due on Friday, December 6th. Okay, so. Um, that seems like that's far away. I know that's over a month away, right? It's November 6th right now. But you got Thanksgiving in there, so it's really not that far away. And so, um, so your final project, like a final project in any class where you get multiple weeks to do it, you do not want to wait till the last week uh, to get started. Uh, so get started immediately. You have everything you need now to start building uh, an application. Uh, yeah, no late days on the final project at all. Simply we will not accept it late. Whatever you have on December 6th at midnight, submit it. I don't care what it is, submit it, because that's all, I'm not going to accept anything. Like, I just can't, because we've got a lot of students who are taking this class, or grade especially, and that's a lot of my time I have to be fair to those people, and also I have to get started grading immediately. Um, the presentation that you're going to do, two minutes, it's really just going to be pitching your project to us, to your fellow classmates. Um, you can imagine uh, it's like uh, you're trying to pitch a VC to invest in your company or uh, to do the app or you're just trying to get people to buy it or whatever. It's that kind of presentation. Leave it up to you. You can certainly do a live demo if you want. Um, you'll need an uh, iPhone 4S or later or you'll need an iPad 2 or later in order to hook up to this wonderful projection system we have uh, using uh, Apple TV mirroring. Um, but uh, you don't have to do a live demo. Live demos are perilous, as you can see, uh, what I do each lecture. But they're also kind of can be effective and really a good way to show off your app. So it's kind of up to you. And that re presentation is required. I will have an alternate presentation time, which is the last lecture of the quarter, that, which is the week before the final exam period. Um, so that's that. Um, yeah, the scope is basically three weeks of homework worth of work. You should know by now approximately what that is. Remember the pass and credit people have to pass both the homework section and the final project separately. You can't bomb one and get an A on the other and pass this class. Um, your final project has to work on hardware. You have to show it working either in a demo in your two minutes or you, if you don't show a demo, live demo in your two minutes, you have to show uh, your TA. Um, only iOS SD code counts. So if your app has a back end, some server somewhere, you get no credit for any of that really. Uh, you're only going to code for credit for iOS code. Okay? So simulate your back end if you have to, or you know, if you have the back end from somewhere else, okay, that's fine, but don't waste time doing non-iOS code in this three weeks because you're not going to get any credit uh, for that work. And you'll be graded on your proper use of the SDK and also proper object-oriented um, programming and uh, your aesthetics will matter so don't put a big junky looking UI that's just like really looks terrible so um, and yeah don't get sidetracked on non iOS code that's kind of a repeat of the last slide there so um, the presentation quality matters uh, a tiny bit it does matter giving a presentation effective presentation is a very important skill to have 
All of you at Stanford should be good at that by the time you get out of here. So here's just another chance to really practice doing a good presentation. Time it, see how long it's going to take, you know, run through it a couple times practicing. Um, your proposal needs to have two sections in it. Okay, the first section is a kind of an overall description, what am I doing? So I, this is best shown by example. So I have this example here, which is the Shakespeare director app. So let's say you're a director um, at a theater company and you're going to be directing some Shakespeare plays and this is an app to help you do that. And so it has uh, a way to bring up a Shakespeare play from the folio database and then you can lay out the blocking, which is the, like where the scene's set up, where the people are standing and all that stuff of each um, scene lined up with the uh, dialogue. And then there's also got a dialogue learning mode for uh, people who want to learn the dialogue, learn their lines. It'll say the other parts and then it'll play, you can say your own part. Um, so you can see that this is kind of a description of what it does uh, as opposed to how you're going to do it. Section two is what parts of iOS are you going to use to implement it? Okay, it's going to have a table view, a custom cells, it's going to use the camera, it's going to have you know, text fields within popovers, it's going to use AV foundation, it's going to have NS timer, it's going to have core data, and here's what are going to be my entities. Um, it's going to print out the blocking things to printer, which is something we don't cover in class. Um, and you're required to have one feature, at least, that it was not covered in lecture. Okay, and so that task is on there, not only so you have to learn something from the documentation instead of my kind of getting you started with it, but also so that you peruse all of iOS and find out what's in there. So don't come to me and say, oh, can you tell me a feature to do for non-iOS not covered in lecture? It's like that's part of the task for you to go figure out what's out there and pick something, okay? Um, so that's what your proposal needs to have, these two sections. What it is you're actually going to do and then what iOS APIs you're going to use that you know of right now to implement it. Okay? Um, and here's some notes. Again, you're going to review these slides offline to really get a good feel for what makes a good uh, proposal. And you can ask on Piazza for clarifications, et cetera. Okay, so the next topic I want to talk about is core data still, but it's core data and table view. How core data and table view uh, go together? Because core data is a bunch of, you know, objects, a big object graph and table views are really great for traversing through object graphs, okay? So how do we do this? There's a great class in iOS called NS Fetched Results Controller. This class's only purpose in life is to link an NS Fetch request, which hopefully you remember from two days ago lecture, with a UI table view. That's what it does. It just basically bonds those two things together. Um, so that the fetch, anything the fetch would be fetching, is always showing in the table view, even if the database is changing underneath that fetch request. Okay, it's still going to be updating in the table view. So um, the way this works, there's really two parts for the fetch results controller. One is it answers all the questions in the UI table view data source protocol, like how many sections, how many rows and sections, and even some ones that you don't know about, some more advanced ones, it answers those questions as well. So it's able to answer all those questions using code kind of like that. Um, also, it can tell you at any given time what uh, thing in your database, what entity in your database is being shown in a given row. Okay? There's a one-to-one -one mapping between a row in the table and some object in the database. Because, right? of course, we know that fetch, when you do a fetch request, it can only return objects of a certain kind, an array of objects, and so uh, this will let you get it. And it's a very important method to understand, which is object of the index path. Okay, you send that to the fetch results controller and it will return you a photo star or a photograph photographer star or some NS manage object star, which is the object that's at that row. And then you can pull out the attributes and put them into the, your UI table view cell in cell for row at index path. Okay? It's really important to understand that method. Um, how do you create one of these NS fetch results controller? Okay, it's in, alloc init looks like this. Uh, it takes a fetch request, a context, that's obviously where we're going to be doing the fetching, right? Um, it'll even do section headers. So you specify which attribute in the objects that you're fetching is the section, the, the name of the section, and then it'll divide the table into sections. And it can also do caching. Okay, so we'll talk about those last two things in a minute here. But let's take a look at what kind of fetch request we might create to put into a fetch request controller. So here I'm creating a photo 
request, so I'm going to be fetching photos. Um, I need a sort descriptor that says what order these photos are going to be in in the table view, so I'll sort them by their title, let's say. Um, and then a predicate, I'm going to get all the predicates that were taken, all the photos rather, that were taken by a photographer with a given name, photog name. Okay, so I just specify the predicate. So I just basically create a normal NSFetch request, and then I just do this fetch, fetch, fetch results controller alloc, fetch request, context, fetch section key name, and cache. It's as simple as that. Okay? Now, oh yeah, so cut those last two items. The cache, by the way, uh, one thing about the cache, you can, if you specify nil, it won't cache. Caching means that it'll cache the results of that fetch between launching of your app. In other words, it'll permanently, you know, on disk cache it. This is not caching it in memory. It all, you know, it's always going to do it in memory caching. Core data does that. So this is making so between launches it has that result cached. But if you set that to non-nil, okay, you better keep your fetch request exactly the same. If you change anything about your fetch request and come back and try to use that cache, it's going to fail. So this is only really for table views that have uh, a, the same fetch request all the time. Exact same predicate, sort descriptors, everything's the same. Um, if you're going to use that section key thing, try and put sections in your table view, the sort descriptors have to match up with the section keys. In other words, the rows in the table, the photos that you fetch, have to be in the exact same order that the section headers would be. And this is a normal table view thing, right? The section headers always have to be in the same order as the rows. Well, that's true here, too. So almost always, your first sort descriptor will be the section key header <laughs> to make sure that the thing is sorting in the same order. Um, the fetch result controller also has a delegate, and using that delegate, it can watch what's happening in core data, and when something changes that would affect your fetch request, it'll change your table, which is incredibly cool. Okay, that means if you added a photo and it would have matched your fetch request, it'll add a row to the table. And you don't have to do anything because it's watching. It's using that NS managed object context did ch objects did change uh, radio station. It's listening to that and it's changing it with methods like this. Okay, so there's really two things to get a fetch request uh, controller hooked up to your table. One is you got to use it to implement all those UI table view data source things, and two is you got to set its delegate and then use all these methods to have it watch. Um, but we've made that easy for you. I've created a class called Core Data Table View Controller, and I'm going to make it available to you. All it does is those two things, and you're welcome to go look at the implementation of it. It's all pretty much just one-liners that are just using the fetch results controller to implement the data source and to do this, the delegate business. Okay? Um, and uh, the only thing you need to know to use Core Data Table View Controller, it has a property called Fetched Results Controller, and you just set that to a Fetch Results Controller and it'll just work. Nothing else required to do. You just set that and Core Data Table View Controller will then use it to answer all those data source questions and also it'll set the delegate of the Fetch Results Controller and make it so it watches the database properly. Okay? So that will be included in your homework. You will definitely want that for your homework. I will be using it in the demo today. All right, so speaking of the demo, this is a huge demo. I may not get all the way through it. It covers some things that I haven't covered in lecture yet, and that's kind of intentionally. This is the only lecture I really do that, but I just want to kind of show you some things that I didn't really want to spend lecture time on. I might come back to these in future lecture, but uh, anyway, there's a lot, lot there to cover, and you have these slides in front of you. Hopefully, you can see what the list there is. Um, I'm not going to come back to the slides, so coming up, uh, today's your last homework. We have an instruments, uh, which is a performance monitoring uh, adjunct to Xcode on Friday's section. And then next week we're going to talk a little bit about multitasking. I say more multitasking because I'm going to do some of that in the demo today. And um, then we're going to do some more advanced segueing. So far the only segueing we've done is uh, UI navigation controller push segues basically. And then also we've talked a little bit about iPad replace segues where you replace the entire detail view, which is kind of a weird segue. Uh, we're going to talk about some more kinds of segues uh, that we can do as well. And maybe we'll get to MapKit next week or maybe the week after. Okay? All right, any questions before I dive into this monster demo? Okay, feel free to stop me. And a lot of times when I'm demo, I'm typing away, I'm not seeing you raise your hand, so feel free to shout out. Uh, so I'm going to create a new project here. And I'm going to do single view application, even though I'm going to use core data. And I told you that if you click on this one, you can see some generated core data code. I'm actually going to use the code that's generated here, but I put it off into a category of, of my application delegate so that you 
don't really need to look at it. Um, I'll include it in the, in the demo and you can see it. But for your homework, you're going to do your um, core data stuff using a document, UI managed document, and I'm not going to show that because I want you to kind of go through the process of trying to figure that out for yourself. So I'm just going to create our normal single view application like we usually do. I'm going to call it Photomania. Um, and it's going to be a universal app, although I'm, not, I'm only going to do the iPhone version. I'm only going to do the bare bones of this application. What this application is going to do is it's going to query Flickr, those URL, the URL for recent georeference photo thing, the same thing we did for Shutterbug. And, uh, but instead of just showing you the photos, it's going to show you the list of photographers who took those photos. And then, you know, after this demo, you could easily make it so if you click on a photographer, it shows you the photos by that photographer. Click on a photo, it uses the image view controller uh, to show you an image. So that's kind of the application we're trying to build. We won't get all the way to building those other table views. We're just going to do this main uh, table view, but that's what this is going to do. And um, the way it's going to do that, the way it's going to show those photographers is kind of a little different strategy than we saw with Shutterbug. I'm going to in the background, basically, of my application, be constantly querying Flickr every once in a while and getting more and more photos and then just throwing them into a core data database. Okay, just throwing them in there in the background. Meanwhile, I'm going to have table views that are going to be looking at that data, looking at the photographers, clicking on them, looking at the photos, and that's just going to always be updating automatically all the time. Okay, so that's the app that we're going to build. So there's some things to talk about here. Uh, how to build a core data database, how to hook it up to a table view with the fetch results controller, how to fetch things in the background. Okay, we're going to talk about all those things today if we have time. All right, so I'm going to call this Photomania. I'll put it in developer where I usually put things. Here it is. I'm going to dive right in with um, building my data model, my schema, as, as you would call it in the database world. This is a description of all the entities and all that stuff. Uh, we saw how to do this all on the slide, so I'm just going to kind of show you what it looks like live. So when I want to create a new schema, I do new file. Okay, so I'm going to do new file. I'm going to go up here to core data and pick this data model, not mapping model, data model right here. So we'll click that. Um, we can call it anything you want. I'm going to call this one the name of my app, Photomania. And it's asking where do you want to put it, and I'm going to put it at the top level here where all the rest of my stuff is. Here's my controller, and delegate, and stuff like that. So I'll put this data modeling file there. And so it creates this data modeling file. Here it is. You can see it's empty. I have no entities or attributes or fetch properties or any of that business. Um, so let's just start adding some. So I'm going to go down here to the bottom, add entity. Click that. It added one called entity. I'm going to double click and call it photo. So I need photo, and I display photographers too, so I better add photographer. Now one thing that's really important when you make a schema is you want to put the entities and the attributes in there that support the kind of UI you're building. Okay, and that's really important for you to understand in your homework. Okay, this homework that I'm assigning you is pretty straightforward as long as you pick a good schema. If you pick the right entities and attributes in the database, it's really easy to just throw up tables of information. If you don't, if you have kind of the wrong schema or just too simplistic of a schema, you don't put in a couple of attributes that you need to make your UI work, it can be like, ah, how do I get that information? So the schema is your slave. You get to make the schema however you think it's going to best support the, the application that you're building. Okay? So, um, photo and photographer. What kind of attributes does a photo have? Well, let's see. Of course, it has its title and it has a subtitle. That's that little description from Flickr. Um, it has the URL of its image from Flickr. It probably has a URL of its thumbnail as well. Um, in fact, we could even store the thumbnail data, which you're going to want to do in your homework right in here. Um, we can put the data in, not just the URLs. And also, importantly, Photos have a unique identifier that comes from Flickr. Because when I get data from Flickr, I don't want to be, sometimes you query Flickr, you get the same photo again. And I don't want to be duplicating that in my core data database. So I'm going to look at that unique ID from Flickr and make those unique in my core data database as well. Um, so I've added these, but I've got to set their, you can see I have a warning here or an error because I haven't set these. If I click on this, you'll see I must have a defined type. So we've got to set a type for these. These all happen to be strings, all four of these. But you could imagine putting things like dates, like for your recents tab in your uh, homework, you probably want to want to have some sort of last viewed date or something like that. It's perfectly reasonable to put in here. And numbers and all that stuff. So we'll just do that. 
Photographers are a little simpler. They just have a name. Okay, a photographer has a name. It's a string. That's about it. And remember I told you we could look at these entities graphically with this little button down here. Here it is right here. They're kind of smashed on top of each other, but I can pick them up and move them. And you can see that as I move one, it kind of moves, makes space, right, to keep them. And if I have relationships between them, it'll keep those relationships um, sensible as I move them around. So let's, let's create a relationship. What is the relationship between a photo and photographer? As we saw on the slides, who took, basically. So I'm just control dragging. I'm holding down control right now and dragging from photo to photographer, and I have this new relationship created. And again, if I move these things around, um, this thing will stay with. So let's go ahead and give these relationships names. On the photo side, this is the who took relationship. And on the photographer side, this is the photos. And uh, we can inspect this right here with this little guy right here, the inspector. And we can see all kinds of things about our particular properties. This is true for properties and also for relationships. And of course, we know that this is a too many relationship, right? Because a photographer can have many photos. So we get this double arrow here. But it's only a two one relationship here because a photo, only one guy took the photo. And so if you move these things around, it'll keep this all kind of looking okay. All right, so now we've kind of set up everything here that we need. It's a pretty simple application, so we don't need any more attributes. But in your application, you're going to have at least one or two more entities and some attributes on there and some more attributes on photo. Um, so uh, so you, I left you with um, some work to do. Um, okay, so now that we have this, we want to be able to access all this stuff in our Objective-C code using properties and normal class syntax. So we're going to do this thing we talked about, which is um, generating um, managed object subclasses. So I'm going to pick this classes that I want. I'm going to go here and say create NS managed object subclass for Photomania. And we'll do photo and photographer, both of them. And we click this, says where do you want them? I'll put those also at the top. I'm going to put everything at the top level here. And here I have my photo and photographer. And I can see that photo looks okay. It's got photographer who took, but mm, photographer not so much, right? It's got NS managed object for remove photos object. This should really be photo star. So I'm just going to generate these things again, okay? And really it's too bad that it doesn't automatically do this two pass generation, but you end up doing it yourself. Get used to doing this generate because you're going to do it a lot. You're going to be constantly adding entities, changing attributes like that, and you're just going to constantly be regenerating these things. It's going to ask you to replace them. And so um, don't be uncomfortable about doing that regenerate. It's a common thing to want to do. And so now we're winning here. Okay. So we have these nice classes and we, now we can use properties to access all of their uh, attributes, right? photo.title to get at the title, for example. But as I said before, we might want to add code. And I do want to add code to photo here. I want to add code to create a photo, okay? To make it so that I can add, a, insert an ob a photo object uh, into the database. And so I'm going to do that using categories. Remember categories is that new Objective-C thing I was telling you about where we can add code to a class without subclassing it. So I'm going to add code to this photo class right here without subclassing photo. Okay, so I do that with file, new file, and instead of picking Objective-C class, I'm going to pick Objective-C category. And when I do, it's going to say, what class do you want to make a category on? I'm going to make a category on the class photo, and I'm going to call it Flickr because that's what this method that I'm add, these methods that I'm going to add to photo are all kind of hooking Flickr, Flickr up to the database. So Flickr seems like a good name for that category. And it wants to know where I'm going to put them, put them here, the same places everywhere as everything else. And so here's my .h and here's my .m and it's asking me, what do you want to do here? So um, the method that I want to implement here is a method that essentially takes a Flickr dictionary and adds a photo object to the um, database and returns a pointer to it to me. Everyone understand what I'm going to do here? So I'm going to call this thing photo, I'm sure I picked the same name so that I don't sidetracked here, photo uh, with Flickr info, and this is going to be an as a dictionary, photo dictionary. And what else do I need besides that photo dictionary to create an object in the database? A hook to the database. Okay, I got to know which database you want me to add this photo to. So I also need in managed object context, 
NS Managed Object Context Context. Okay, and that's all I need. Just the flicker information and the context. That's the place you want me to create this photo, and I will. Okay. And I'm also going to have another one here because I know that I'm going to be downloading these Flickr photos in big bunches every time I call URL georeference photos or whatever it's called. I'm going to get a whole bunch of them, like 100 or 200 of them. So I'm going to have a bulk load one that I'm going to call load photos uh, uh, from Flickr array, NS array photos of Flickr NS dictionary into managed object context. Oops. NS manage object context. Context. Okay, so that's just going to bulk. It's going to call this basically um, repeatedly, although that might not be the most efficient way to do that. We'll talk about that um, a little bit. So let me implement these two methods. Okay, this is the interface of my category. And so here's the implementation of my category. Now, I can do whatever I want to implement these, except I can't use any uh, instance variables. So I can't have any properties that are you know, here. So I have to implement them basically in terms of photo, if that makes sense that way. So this is going to return a photo. So I'm going to say photo equals nil. And down here, return photo. And in between, I've got to go find this photo in the database, or create it, or uh, what, whatever it may be. So let's start with asking the database, do you already have this photo? And so how am I going to ask the database if the photo is already there? And the answer is, I'm going to try and fetch it. So I'm going to have a fetch request, and it's going to be a fetch request into the photo table, if you want to think about it, or into photos. It's going to return photos, okay, because I'm trying to find a this photo. And then the request needs a predicate. And what is the predicate? Which photo am I looking for? Well, I'm looking for the photo whose unique equals the same unique that is in this photo dictionary right here. So let's go get that. And as string star unique equals, and we're going to need our flicker fetcher import flicker fetcher.h. So I'm going to grab flicker fetcher.h from the thing we did before, which was shutterbug. So here's shutterbug and here's flicker fetcher. I'm just going to drag that whole thing right in here. All right, so now I have flicker fetcher.h. And inside flicker fetcher.h, uh, we can get the photo's unique ID with this Flickr photo ID. Okay, so I'm going to go down here and say uh, photo dictionary, Flickr photo ID. Now, now I might want to do value for key path here, just in case this Flickr uh, photo ID might be have dots in it or whatever. Uh, Flickr, -er. you know, it might have dots in it like the description has. Okay, I'll leave this way here, but value for key might be a good idea. So here I'm basically going to fetch into the database to try and find this unique photo, see if it's already there. And I do that by saying I need an NS error here. Then I'm going to say NS array matches equals context, because we always have to ask a context to do a fetch. Okay, execute fetch request, that request, and if there's an error, return an error. Okay, so now I've got those photos. Those photos, hopefully, in this case, a matching photo, or maybe not, has been pulled out. Now, this matches can have a number of different um, states or different values. One thing is, it might be nil. If it's nil, okay, or this error is not nil, I would say or error, or another error condition here is that the matches matches count is greater than one, okay? Because these are supposed to be unique. And so if I somehow got multiple photos by doing this, that would also be an error condition. So I have to handle error here. Eck, handle error. We're not going to do that today, but you can imagine. Okay, otherwise, uh, if the matches found something, 
then we can just return it. Okay? So how do we return it? This is an array, but this array is going to have the one and only one match, so I'm going to say matches first object. You could also say last object. Otherwise, this matches.count is zero, so it returned an array, an empty array. That means I looked for that photo that had that unique, I couldn't find it, so that photo doesn't exist. Now I need to create it. Okay, everyone remember how to create an object in the database? NS entity description, insert ob new object for entity for name. We're inserting a photo, and we obviously have to specify the context. Okay, so we've created a photo. Excellent. And now let's go ahead and uh, set the attributes of the photo. I'm also going to set the photos unique, equal to unique. All right, so here I'm setting the photo's title, subtitle, image URL. So, um, so here I'm just setting the title using value for key path out of the Flickr dic dictionary, the subtitle getting the description, the URL, I'm using this URL for photo format thing, I have to turn it into a string. Okay, because can't put URLs in the database, but we can put strings there. And then I also have the photographer name. But I have a relationship to a photographer entity, so now I need to create a photographer as well. So here, loading a photo, right, from Flickr is causing a photographer also to be created. Okay, and this is going to happen in your homework too, in spades, okay, where you're going to download these photos from Flickr and you're going to build your entire database. All, lots of entities are going to be created all the time, every time things come back from Flickr. Okay, so how do we create a photographer? Well, I'm going to do the same thing I did here, where I have this photo category that creates that. I'm going to do the same thing for photographer. So I'm going to say new file, another category. This one's going to be a category in photography. Photographer, this one's not Flickr specific because photographer only has a name. So I'm going to call this category, just to be different, create instead of Flickr. Okay, so we'll put this in the same place. Here it is right here. It's up here. And um, photographer, yeah, uh, it's very similar. It looks almost exactly the same. We're going to fetch for it. We're going to handle if we can't find it, set the name, all that business. So let's put this in the header file. Okay, just trying to speed it up a little bit here. If you wouldn't learn anything new by my doing this all again. Okay, but now I have a way to create a photographer given a name in a given context. So we'll use that over here, and we'll just say photo dot who took equals and we got to import that little category photographer create photographer oops photographer photographer with name and the name is the photographer name that we got out of the Flickr thing and same context okay everyone understand this method right here so this method is going to, uh, if we give it a Flickr dictionary from a photo info, it's going to give us back a photo object in the database, either by creating it or by finding one that's already there. Okay? And it'll return nil if it has a problem. But it's okay. Everybody got that? Okay. So now that we have this thing, we have these nice ways to access it, let's talk a little bit about the table view and how we're going to display this stuff in a table view. And it's really simple matter of creating a, um, a new table view subclass that uh, implements that fetch results controller business. And I told you that you were going to have this core data thing to make that easy, easy, so we're going to use that. Here is the core data table view controller. I'm going to drag it in. We'll take a look at it here. All right, so here's the core data table view. Uh, here's its header file. You can see it just has this fetched results controller thing. It also has a way to force it to fetch, but you don't ever have to do that. It'll happen automatically. So it has this property. If you look at the implementation of this thing, besides setting the fetch, the uh, result, fetch result controller, which is mostly just a bunch of logs okay, that I put in there, it's implementing UI table view data source, you see, in terms of the fetch result controller. And then it's also doing this delegate business where it's watching for changes in the database. Okay, and that's it. That's all it does. And this code is actually copied and pasted from the documentation for NS fetch results controller, so this is nothing uh, exciting in here. So when we create a table view that wants to look in the database, okay, when we create an Objective-C class, we're going to make it be a subclass of core data table view controller. So I'm going to create one, and I'm going to call it photographers, I'm going to call it CDTVC, core data table view controller. Okay, it's kind of a naming convention some people like to use. 
And so I'm going to do that. And because it displays photographer, that's what it does. So let's create that. Let's put it top level, same place as everywhere else. Here it is. It's created it. I don't need any of this business for that. And let's think about its public API. What does this thing need? Well, it needs what most things need that are doing database stuff. It needs a NS managed object context. And so this class, its job in life is going to be, it'll show you all the photographers in a given context, a given database. You give it a pointer to a database, it'll look in there and show you all the photographers in it. That's what this thing's going to do. Okay? So to make that happen, all it needs to do is set that fetched results controller thing in its super class, right, which is this core data uh, table view controller. So I'm going to do that. As soon as someone sets the manage object context, oops, let's call this managed object context so it's a little clearer. As soon as someone sets this managed object context, I'm going to be able to uh, set up my fetch results controller. I can't set up my fetch results controller until I have the context. Sometimes the context comes to me via public API like this. Some, some view controllers will get their context from other objects. Most notably, and pay attention here for your homework, if someone gives you a managed object, like a photo or a photographer, you now have the context. Because NS managed object has a method in it called managed object context. It will give you the context that that object came out of, okay? So it's really important to understand. If someone gives you a photo, you have a managed object context. But this thing is at the top level. It's showing all the photographers we don't have anything yet out of the database, so someone has to tell us the context, which database to fetch these things out of. So now I just need to say, Fetch results controller equals something, and so I'm going to create a new fetch results controller. Alec, oops, Alec init, and its init has all these arguments here. It needs a fetch request. Okay, well, actually, let's so we don't get this kind of wackiness. Let's go ahead and make all the arguments first. It needs a fetch request because that's what it does: is hook up a fetch request to something, and so this is. Um, a request into the um, photographer table, right? So we want photographer. We're going to show all the photographers. Um, the, the predicate for this thing is nil. What does that mean, predicate nil? Predicate nil means all of them, OK? So if you say predicate nil, that means give me all the photographers. And sort descriptor, yeah, let's sort these things. Let's sort them by. Uh, let's see, sort descriptor with key. Well, sort the photographers by their name. Okay. Amazingly, you can actually sort things by things through relationships. So you can sort it by other objects' properties if you want. But here, photographer, we're going to have it sort by uh, its name. And yes, we're going to have it ascending. And we're going to use the selector here called localized standard compare, okay. which is what we use mostly for strings that are going to appear in the user interface. Okay, um, oops, and we need to close our array there because this is an array of sort descriptors. We only need one. And we could limit, like, for example, we could say only give us 100. We only want to see 100 photographers, which would be kind of silly because we're sorting, we are sorting alphabetically, so this would not make sense because we wouldn't get to see the people whose names unfortunately happen to be end of the alphabet. So we wouldn't do it here. But in other cases, you would. In your homework, you, you very well might do that. Um, all right, so now we have the re request. Uh, we have the managed object context. That's an argument to this uh, method. It's what we're setting, actually. Here's the section thing. We could make sections here, but there's really nothing in a photographer to do that, so we won't do that. And we're not going to cache. Okay. So that's it. That's really all that's required to make this table view work, except for one thing, which is that fetch results controller, I told you it implemented all the UI table view data source things, but there's one of them it can't implement, which is self or row and index path. Okay. It doesn't really know what attributes of the object you want to put in which parts of the UI table view cell, right? The title, the subtitle, image, it doesn't know those things. So we have to implement that ourselves. So that's UI table view cell, uh, self or row and index path. You should be very, very, very familiar with this thing. Uh, it just looks like this, cell equals self.tableView. A DQ, and well, these are photographers, so we'll call this photographer cell. We've got to make sure uh, you guys are going to keep me honest, make sure I remember to set that in the storyboard when we create one of these in the storyboard. 
And now I need the photographer that is at this row and section. Okay, so I'm going to import photographer first of all. Not create. Not H. Okay, so this is photographer. And then I'm going to say photographer equals, and how do I do this? Photographer equals self.fetch results controller, object at index path, index path. Now I have the photographer that's in this row. Okay? So now that I have that, I can do things like text label dot text equals, let's say, the photographer's name, of course. Um, also, how about something cool like this? Cell dot detail text label equals a string with format. What if I want to put how many photos this photographer has taken? Well, that information is readily available to me in the database. Percent D photos photographer dot photos count. Okay, thank you Xcode. Appreciate the way it does that. Okay, right, so I just get, go through that thing, the who took photos relationship. I just grab the photo side. It's an NS set. NS set implements count. I, I got what I need. Okay, and then let's return the cell. Okay, everyone understand this self row at index path? Question? That default controller came in from code data table view controller that we subclassed? Yes, this property, fetch result controller, is inherited from core data table view. Exactly, good question. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, build our uh, storyboard while we're at this and while we have this fresh in our mind. So here it is. This is the kind of default one we got. Let's get rid of this. We don't want this. Let's go bring out a table view. So here I'm just going to drag a table view out here. Um, I'm going to set it to be a um, uh, photographer's core data table view controller, right? Boop. And then let's set up our cell the way we want. We want it to be subtitle because it's going to have the uh, photographer name and then how many photos they took. We need to make sure it's photographer cell is our reuse identifier. Otherwise, we're ready to go. So if we had stuff in our database and we hit run right now, this would work. That's all we need to do. Get okay, incredibly small amount of code to hook up a table view to core data. But of course, we have no data in our database. There's nowhere in our code are we querying from Flickr or loading stuff in. And so um, I'm going to use the opportunity that, of our needing that to introduce you for the first time to your application delegate. So I've always been moving these files down to supporting files, don't look at them, you know. And so now I'm going to show you a little bit what's in here. So your application delegate is kind of like, uh, it is watching what's going on at the highest level of ap your application. It sees your application has launched, okay. It sees that your application has resigned being the active application. It sees that your application is entering the background. Okay, we know that in iOS, the apps, when you go to another app, they don't quit. They just kind of move into this background state, right? So you can find that. You can find it when you move back into the foreground. If you become the active application, if, they're, if someone's quitting your application, you find that out as well. So it finds out all these things, and we're going to learn about those later in the quarter. So I'm going to delete all those now. Uh, but we are going to look at this one. This is did finish launching with options. So here it's telling you your application finished launching. Okay, this is a great time to do things like kick off some Flickr fetching or something. All right. Now, if I'm going to be doing my Flickr fetching here in my application delegate, I need the context. Okay. Now, in your homework, you're going to do that by creating a UI managed document. But here, I have a little piece of code that I got from that other template that I was telling you about that I'm going to bring in here. It looks like this. It's a little category. And uh, it has this method, create main queue managed object context. So that's a managed object context that attaches to uh, the, a database, the database for this app. This only has one, luckily. Uh, and gives me uh, a queue. And it's on the main queue, just like a UI document was one is. So it can be, the code can be similar. And then also I can save it. Now, I don't need this save context message for UI managed document because it auto saves. But here, if I create this managed object context not using a document, uh, then I have to do that. So this is, like I said, the other way to do it, which you're not going to do for your homework. But I just wanted to show you, um, I really just didn't want to show you the UI managed document because I want you to figure that out on your own. So we're going to use this one. Okay, so I've added this. This is a, uh, you can see the Photomania app delegate 
uh, category, so it's essentially added these two methods to my app delegate. Okay. Now what I'm going to do here is I am just going to, first of all, let me create some properties. So this is some stuff that I just created, uh, some properties that I need and stuff like that. For time, I'm just going to put them in here, but as we use them, I will uh, refer to them. But one of them I'm going to use right here is this photo database context. So I'm going to keep a property in my app delegate, which is the context that we're going to be fetching into and that we're going to be reading out of. So I'm going to set that right here, photo database context equals self uh, create, create, oh, got to import that, import photomania. Uh, MOC, that I'm just importing the category header file that has that create in there. So uh, create main queue managed object context. So again, you're going to set this as well, but you're going to set it uh, from your UI managed document. So now I have a context and I want to start doing some flicker fetches. So I'm going to call another method here, start, uh, what did I call it, start flicker fetch, I think. Okay, so that's just going to fire off a flicker fetch as soon as we launch. Okay, we just launched. Get this message, get sent to us when we launch, and I'm just going to fire off a flicker fetch. So that's one of the times we're going to fetch is as soon as we launch. We're going to fetch some other times, but we're going to fetch as soon as we launch. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put this in here so we can look at it instead of my typing it in line by line. And um, this is something where um, it's got some stuff that I didn't really teach really in detail in lecture, but you should mostly be able to understand. Mostly what this is doing here is it creates a session. So you know about URL sessions. So I'm creating this session. This session is a little different than the one we created before because look, it has a delegate. You see that? We didn't specify a delegate before. Okay, we had delegate nil. And why do we want a delegate and why are we making it self? Well, that's because we want these Flicker fetches that we're starting off in the background, if they finish while our application is no longer running, we want it to launch our application and tell us. Or if we're in the background, we're not the application the user is using right now, and these URLs, Flickr comes back with some information, we want it to you know, make us, wake us up a little bit and let us process it. Okay? So by doing this delegate along with a background session, we can do that. So I'm going to show you that this delegate implementation. So I create this session, and then all I'm doing here in start flicker fetch is creating a task and resuming it. So this is the exact same thing we did before, right? Had a URL session, we created a download task. Task. The only difference is last time we did with completion handler, and we had a little block that would happen when the download came back. Now instead, our delegate's going to get called when the URL it gets loaded and comes back. Does everyone understand the difference between what we did before and what we're doing here? Okay, no completion handler. Here we're going to use a delegate. So let's look at what that delegate looks like. Looks like this. Okay, there are three methods in it. These three methods right here. Um, one is your file just finished downloading, and here it is as a local file. So this looks a lot like that completion handler. And then here's a couple that we're not going to use, like giving you, uh, this gives you some progress, how many bytes it's read so far, if it does it in chunks. Um, and this also, download sessions can get interrupted and then resumed. We're definitely not going to talk about that, but um, anyway. Now you can see I have an error here. Okay, so what do we do? So this is what we would have done in our completion handler. And all we're going to do here is it, we are going to get the context, our little photo database context that we set up there in application to finish launching. We are going to download those photos from Flickr. So Flickr photos that you, is this which you're very used to, right? Data with contents of URL, JSON, dejsonize it, grab the results out of that. Okay, so we're going to do that little thing. This needs to be happening, you know, uh, th this is a local URL, so it can be happening on the main thread, no problem. Now we're going to do something in this context, and notice I'm doing perform block. I didn't do perform block over in the photo creating one because it's kind of implicit. I'm creating a photo, of course I'm doing it on that context. So whoever calls that would want to do it in perform block and that's in fact what I'm doing here. Um, I'm calling that method we just wrote, load photos with Flickr data. Okay, we didn't actually write that method so let's look at that. So that's over here. All right, we had photo with Flickr info and here's loading the photos. So how do we load the photos? I'm just going to say for NS dictionary photo in photos. 
Okay, so give me each Flickr photo one by one, and then self photo with Flickr info photo in managed context context. Now, this turns out to be really inefficient way of loading those hundred Flickr photos because every time I call this, I am, oops, I am doing a fetch. So if I want to load 100 photos, I could do 100 fetches to see if those are unique. Okay, there are much better ways to do this, and one of your extra credit items is for you to try and figure out a better way to do this. Okay, and one way is to look at the unique IDs of all 100 photos, fetch them all at once, see which ones are in the database because you can get a list of them back, right? The ones that are in there. And then you can, one by one, you can go and create the ones that aren't there. Okay, so that's one way to do it. Okay, but this cheap and simple way is good for a demo. <laughs> okay, so back to our app delegate. And now we have this load photos with Flickr array. Let's go ahead and import that header file, uh, which I do. Oh, maybe I called it something different there. Uh, what's the problem? Let's see, uh, yeah, I probably called it something different. Copy. All of the same thing. Where's my delegate? Here it is. Ace, there we go. I call it load photos from Flickr array. Okay, so that's going to load all these photos. Notice I'm saving my context here. Okay, this is a method in NS Managed Object Context which saves it. This is an error which I'm ignoring. Uh, don't really need to do this for your UI managed document, but it doesn't hurt. You can do it if you want. It, it, this would not break anything if you had a context from UI managed do document, but mine's not, so that's why I'm explicitly saving it here after I load some photos in. Okay. Um, okay, so that's cool. So let's go look at our table. What is our table's public API? Managed object context. We never set that. Okay, we need to set this table's managed object context. Okay, when and how are we going to do that? We have this application delegate. It's kind of this global thing, and it is managing this global database, but it needs to be able to communicate this thing out to anyone who needs to use it. And the way we're going to do that is whenever we set this photo database context, we are going to post a notification, the radio station thing. So this is the first time you're going to see how to post a notification, not just listen with Ad Observer. You're going to actually post it right here. So let's do that. And when you post a notification, you almost always, 100% of the time, want to create a header file. So I'm going to create a header file. Just go here to header file, C, C++ header file. And that header file is going to contain the name of the notification and also the name of anything that's in the user info for the notification. So let's go ahead and make sure it's in the right place. It is. I'm going to call this photo database availability because that's what this notification is about. This radio station talks about whether the photo database is available. So I'm going to create this header file. And inside this header file, I'm just going to put two pound finds. One is photo database availability notification. That's the name of the notification. I'm going to call it this. Call it anything I want, but I'm going to call it that. And then also when the no notification goes out, I'm going to include the context in the radio station broadcast so the person can just get it when they get the notification. And I'll do that with photo database availability context. And I'll use the same, well, I'll just say context. It can be anything you want. Okay, so this is going to be the name of the notification. This is going to be the key into the dictionary of information that comes along with the notification. All right, so now let's send that notification, and I'm going to do that every time we set this photo database context. Question? Uh, so your context static thing you had equals context, where you had one you didn't have equals, or I assume one of them not how you intended Oh, yeah, probably. Good point. Yeah, yeah no equals there. Text. Very good. Okay, this is just a pound sign to find. If it was a const, I'd probably be eating it and doing that. Okay, um, all right, so um, let's set this uh, photo database context. So in the set, I think I might have a thing for that actually, set photo database. Yeah, I do. So here, when we set this photo database context, we are going to po post this notification. And we do that is using the NS Notification Center, default center, post notification name. We just specify the name, which is this. For this to work, we need to import that photo availability, photo database availability header. Okay, so we're just going to post this notification and we're going to give this user info along with it. And the user info is just a dictionary 
that has one key, which is that context, and the value of that key is the context. Okay? So this is how you post in the radio station model. Any questions about that? And now I'm going to show you listening to a radio station without having to create another method and all this stuff. Basically, really straightforward listening. And who needs to listen to this? Well, this guy does. This photographer guy, he needs to listen to it. So basically, as soon as this guy awakes, and I might do this in its init uh, with style or whatever the designated initializer is for a table view, but I'm just going to do an await for nib for here because we know this table view is coming out of it the storyboard. I'm just going to say notification center. First let's import that availability thing. So I'm going to do NS notification center, default center. Watch this, add observer. Normally we do it with a selector and all this stuff. I'm going to do a block based one and I couldn't show you this before because you didn't know blocks, but it's this one. Add observer for name and we give the name which is photo database availability notification. Um, the object is who can send it, and I'll let anyone send this to me. It's going to be the app delegate, but it could be anybody. The queue, I'm going to do it on the queue that I'm on now. That's what nil means, but I could say NS operation main queue or some other queue even. But I'm going to say nil, which means whatever queue I'm on right now when this is being executed. Using block, so I'm going to double click here to put a block, okay, and then that's the end of that. And what's going to be in this block? This is one line of code self.managedObjectContext equals this notification, its user info, photo database context. Okay? Sorry for the very, very long line there. Maybe it'll fit. Yeah, it will. Okay? So I'm getting this block gets executed whenever this radio station broadcasts. And because I put that user info, user info of the context, now I have the context. And I just set my own managed object context, and voila, it's going to load this table. Question about that? So that's notifying both on posting and receiving. All right, so now hopefully it'll work. Let's go take a look at this. And there it is. Okay. Now, it went really fast there because it actually did the load last time, but we just didn't see it. So the database was loaded. So I'm going to show you what it looked like to load up, okay? So how do I clean this out? Okay, how do I clean my database out? And you're really going to want to know this, so really watch this, okay? Um, if you want to get rid of your database, especially if you want to change its schema, because if you change its schema and then you relaunch, it's going to say incompatible database type. So if you want to get rid of it, just press the home key. Well, I also recommend quitting in Xcode first. Then press the home key, hold down, you know, press to hold. You can do this on your device too. And then you'll get these jigglies, and then press the X to delete that application. And that will delete the entire application, including the database. And now when I launch again in Xcode, it is going to start up blank, doing the flicker fetch in the background. When that managed object context is filled out with data, it ma magically automatically appears in the table view. That's because that fetch results controller is watching the context. Okay? Questions? What if you set the user info on the, in like the managed object context? Yeah, let's go back and look at that. The question, the question is where, where did I set that user info? This little user info right here, where did I set that? And that was when I posted the notification here in my app delegate which I did when I set the context, which I did when I launched. Right, so I launch. Here's, here's launching. When I launch, I create the context. You're going to create it with UI Manage Document. I set it right here. This is the setter for that. Okay, I set it. Then I post it to available to everybody else. Okay? Question. Yeah, so the question is, uh, how can I make sure that the view controller is, uh, is exists and is listening in time to hear this? Because the application delegate is posting this pretty early, right after launch. It's sending out this notification. And the answer to that is, that's why I do this in Awake from Nib, really early in the view controller's life cycle, right? When it's first created, so it has a maximum chance of getting it. But 
It's possible, it's unlikely, but it's possible that some view controller you might create later in time might need it. And in that case, you might need a different mechanism, or you might need to repost, or you might need to pass it along. Okay, a lot of times we don't want to use this mechanism to give the context to view controllers exactly because the view controller doesn't exist yet. And so when this availability happens, it's not even there. So there are other ways to pass your manage object context around, and you always want to use those before a way like this. Okay, and I mentioned that in the hints of their homework is, you know, pass the manage object context to a view controller that's, that's an NSFetch results controller controlled in a sensible way, in a way that makes sense. If you're segueing to it, pass it to it by preparing it, right? You wouldn't want to rely on something like this. Okay, all right, now let's talk about loading our database some more. Okay, right now we only loaded our database on launch. Here's the application did finish launching with options. We load our database right here and start Flickr fetch. That's it. Okay. Well, that's not very good. That just means we only get one batch of data ever when we launch our app. We have to quit our app and relaunch it all the time. So what about kind of loading this Flickr information in the background? And we can do that, but we're, there's really two different background conditions to consider. One is background and our app is in the background. In other words, the user is not currently using our app. Okay, they were using it, but now it's in the background. Okay, how do I fetch when that happens? Well, fetching there is kind of limited by the system. The system's not going to let you just go hog wild fetching things when you're not the app that the user is using, but it'll let you do it sometimes. Okay, and the way you can get the system to kind of wake you up and let you fetch sometimes in the background, every once in a while, I don't know, a few times a day, who knows what, but sometimes, is using background fetching, which is a multitasking API. Um, new for iOS 7. And so I'm just going to show you this as an example of what some of the multitasking uh, you APIs look like. Now the way you turn this on is you edit your project. You see this is my project I clicked on up here. And now you're going to go to this tab right here, Capabilities. So I go to Capabilities, and there's a lot of capabilities. This really kind of gives you a feeling of how we're only skimming the surface of iOS when you look at all these things you can do. But anyway, we're going to do this one right here, background modes, and I'm going to turn this on. When I turn it on, there's all kinds of background modes, things that I can be allowed to do in the background. I, that is to say, when my app is not currently being used by the user. And I'm going to pick this one down here, background fetch. And if I turn this on, okay, background fetch, then I will occasionally, by the system, at its discretion, send a message to my app delegate, perhaps even launching me to do it. Okay? And what is that message that gets sent? I'll show it to you right here. It is called, we're going to type it in, application. So you can look at all the things you can receive from your application. There is just a billion of them here. See them? Okay. So we'll cover some of those, but not all of them, but there's quite a few of them in here. But the one you get when you do this is this one right here, perform fetch with completion handler. Okay. So this gets sent to you. And it's basically saying, okay, I'm giving you an opportunity to go do something in the background, a fetch or whatever you want to do. Usually it's a fetch, but you can kind of do whatever you want here. And the only responsibility you have in doing this is to call this completion handler when you're done. That's the only thing you absolutely have to do. If you don't call that in a timely manner, the system will grow tired of you and it will stop fetching. It will stop sending you this message. So the more timely you respond to this, the more likely it's going to let you fetch in the background. Okay, so what are we going to do in here? Well, turns out all we're going to do in here is start a flick, flick, Flickr fetch. And then we're immediately going to call this completion handler. Now, this, we're not done. This fetch, we just started it. It's going to take a while to come back later, but we're done as far as this background fetch thing is continued. Okay, getting the results and doing all that, that's going to happen at some other time. But here, we're done. And we have to, the argument to this completion handler, is a back UI background fetch result, which is whether whatever you did in here changed your UI. Because if it did, we need to update the little task switcher. Okay, does everyone know what the task switcher is in iOS 7? Looks like this. Okay, here's the task switcher. It lets you go through and look at various apps. None of my apps do, are doing anything here. Um, let's launch an app. Let's do, launch Safari here. Okay, so now I go in the task switcher and here's Safari. See how it's showing me what's actually in Safari? It's not really showing me what's in Safari right now. It's kind of showing me Safari the last time I left Safari. 
Or if I get this background fetch and I and in this completion handler I say UI background fetch uh, new data, then it would redraw that thing for me. It would give me a chance to redraw it. But I don't actually have any new data. I have no data here because I haven't gotten the data from this yet. This Flickr fetch has not come back yet. So it's not going to do anything. Okay? So this is great. This lets me occasionally fire off a background fetch. But when the data comes back in, then what, I, what do I do? Well, if I'm in the background, none of these URL things are going to get called. Okay? Because I'm backgrounded. Now, uh, it's not strictly true that these won't get called, because what will happen is, if the URL returns while I'm in the background, so I started it in the background, if it returns, I'll get another application thing called application handle events for background URL session. Okay? And it also has a completion handler. Did a little different one. Okay? So this is called whenever things happen in the background. Now what's interesting about this one is, I don't actually need to do anything in this one either. Because if I implement this method, then these delegate methods down here will automatically get called. And they already know how to, you know, unpackage the data from Flickr and put it in my database. They already know how to do all that. But I still do have this responsibility for the completion handler on this one too. Okay? Okay? Now, this completion handler, we really do want to wait to call it until we've actually handled this URL coming back from Flickr. Okay, this is handling a URL coming back from Flickr. So now we're going to wait. So I'm going to have to hold on to it. So I am going to, I have an instance variable here where I'm going to hold on to this completion handler. Here's the instance variable right here. Okay, it's a void, takes no arguments, just a property. All blocks, by the way, want to be copy properties. Blocks need to be copied into the heap when you keep a handle to them. Just something to know. Um, so anyway, all I need to do is keep this thing. And then I need to call this when I'm done. So I have a method down here that I used to do that with. It's called Flickr download tasks might be complete. Because I might have multiple download tasks happening. And so what I do here is I get all the tasks that my Flickr download session is doing. That's what this method does. And it has a little block that gets called because it can't do that immediately. Sometimes it takes a little time to figure that out. And then if there are no download tasks left, right, not download count, task count, then I'm going to call this completion handler, this Flickr download background completion handler, and say that I'm done. Okay, so now I have finished downloading it. I've redrawn my UI, and I'm calling the completion handler. And this completion handler doesn't have the little uh, UI no data thing because it always assumes that you're going to update your UI. Okay, so it's always assuming it's always going to redraw when you do that. Okay, so let's see what this look. Okay, T to see what this is going to look like, there's a really cool way to do. Well, let's okay, let's do this two two part here. Right, I'm going to run this. Here it is right here. You can actually simulate fetching in the background in Xcode. So I'm going back to Xcode. Here's my UI. Okay, I'm going to say from Xcode under debug, simulate background fetch. And watch what's going to happen in my UI. Whoop, I got put in the background. Okay, and it's doing a fetch. It's going in Flickr. It's downloading to Flickr and doing all that stuff. And actually, if I went like this when it was done, I would see the results in here. Okay, now that's hard for you to see. Here, so I'm going to show you another way to simulate a background fetch besides this. So let's delete Photomania so that our tables are empty. You'll be really be able to see it clearly here. Oops, should have quit Xcode first. Hopefully I didn't mess it up. Um, and so what I'm going to do here is there's a way to launch your application as if it just got launched from a background fetch. And the way you do that is uh, edit scheme. If you edit this little scheme, the scheme is how it's launching you. In this case, it's launching us in a simulator. So if you edit scheme and you go over to options, there's this little switch here, launch due to a background fetch. In other words, when I hit run, pretend I just got launched because a background fetch got sent to me. Okay? So that's what that means. Now, normally we're not going to set that switch and leave it set like that. You can actually duplicate this scheme. So I have the scheme, I'm going to duplicate it. I'm going to call it my BFF scheme. That means background flicker fetcher. Okay, it's my BFF scheme. And in my BFF scheme, um, I'm going to have that switch set. 
Okay? In my other scheme, if I go back to this scheme and edit it, that switch is not set. Okay? So if I want to pr you know, pretend that's happening, I go to my BFF uh, scheme and I press run. Now, when I run, see it ran me in the background. So the other two things, or the other thing I really wanted to show you here, which I don't really have time to do, actually I'll do it real quick, is how about fetching when I'm the foreground app? What happens if I, the user is currently using me and I want to fetch periodically? Okay, that's a totally different thing. To do that, we're going to use a class called nstimer. Okay, so I'm going to put this here. Once the database context is available, then I'm going to fire off a timer using this nstimer method, schedule timer with time interval. I'm going to do this one. How often should we do our Flickr fetch? Well, it doesn't seem like Flickr updates it more than once every 10 or 15 minutes, so let's do it every 20 minutes. Okay, so this is in seconds. Uh, so I'll do 20 minutes, and the target is going to be myself. In other words, every 20 minutes, send me a method, and the method to send me is um, start Flickr fetch, uh, and the argument, and no user info. Um, uh, sorry, this has to be a colon. I'll show you why in a second. And uh, repeats, yes. So I want this to just be every 20 minutes, it's sending this timer. Okay? So why does this start flicker fetch here have to have a colon? That's because this timer, when it sends its message, it always has an argument. And if I do start flicker fetch with the argument, it's the NS timer that sent it to you. But in this case, I don't care. I'm just going to start the Flickr fetch. So every 20 minutes, I'm going to fire off this Flickr fetch. OK? So that's easy. So if you're in the foreground, now this timer will not fire when you're in the background. It just will not fire. But that's OK, because we have that background fetching thing firing it. Not as often, but occasionally. OK, but now all the time, our app is getting new Flickr information all the time. Make sense? Okay, so that's all I wanted to show you. Hopefully, you get, uh, there's a lot of information there. I know we got background fetching, we got foreground fetching, you got creating the database model, you got doing the categories to create the adding things, we got the table view with the NS fetch results controller. I'm going to post all this code. I'll throw some comments in there tonight so you can remember what all these things do, and uh, you'll be good to go. All right? So good luck with your homework, and I'll see you on Monday. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.